This is Kate Swoboda, creator of YourCourageousLife.com, director of the Courageous Living Coach Certification at TeamCLCC.com, and author of the book, The Courage Habit, which is available at booksellers and at Amazon. The Your Courageous Life podcast is all about going after what you want and creating and living a more courageous, emotionally resilient life. Might drop a couple of F-bombs, so maybe don't listen with your kids in the backseat of the car. And here we go with today's episode. Hey, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about how to create healthy habits. And when I'm talking about healthy habits, today, I will be talking about physical health. Now, of course, in reality, we are biopsychosocial beings. Our physical biology is always interacting with our personal psychology and with the social environment around us. And so when we talk about health, there are lots of different definitions of health. There are many intersections of health. Today, I am specifically focusing just on physical health. And the reason I'm focusing just on physical health is because it has been an area that I had to put a lot of attention into. Growing up, my parents always really valued academics and intellectual things. I had um, piano lessons from the local community center. Um, And it wasn't that my parents ever looked down on uh, examining one's physical health or anything like that. It's more so that all of our activities together tended to orient around things like sitting and watching television or eating together. Meals were frequently pulled together on the fly. There was a period where uh, some members of my family and thus me by extension were food insecure, a term I did not know until I later went to school. And Oh, there's an actual term for when you don't know where your next meal is coming from and you, you can't necessarily afford your next meal. So I grew up not very active physically, not eating very well at all. And then I grew to become an adult who really just didn't put any emphasis on physical activity um, and didn't really eat very well. Like a microwave meal, that worked for me. Bowl of cereal, like, okay, I'll just grab it. And you probably know something of where this story is going, which is that those sorts of behaviors can work for a little while, but eventually, unfortunately, they do bite you in the butt later you know, right about the time you get out of your 20s. So if anybody who is listening to this is in their 20s and they're like, oh, that kind of sounds like me, I would suggest you make the changes sooner rather than later. Um, Because ultimately where I ended up, and this I don't think was the result of my exercise, sleep, or eating habits. I think this was genetic, but I don't think my exercise, sleep, or eating habits were helping in this department at all. Ultimately, I ended up with a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease. So when that diagnosis came through, that was kind of my come to Jesus moment. I need to start taking a lot of these things more seriously. But to be honest with you, even after the diagnosis, there was like this immediate period of about three months where it was kind of panicky. I have to take this seriously. Then going back to, I don't know what I'm doing again. And what ultimately changed it all was understanding habit formation. Because once I understood habit formation, which I had begun to research very intensively for the writing of my book, The Courage Habit, once I understood habit formation, I was able to see how I could apply the tools of habit formation to my life to try to get really consistent about the things I knew I needed to be more consistent about, but for various intense purposes, reasons, was not consistent about. And I actually... I suppose if I say various intents and purposes, I was not consistent. I would absolutely say I didn't really know how to be consistent other than through sheer willpower and willpower will always run out if that is the only thing you're using. So I totally had an understanding and knowledge of, yes, you need to sleep more. Yes. You need to get vegetables into your, you know, day to day somehow Yes, you need to get some kind of exercise and movement. But I took a willpower approach to those things, which was waking up in the morning going, okay, I'm going to get my vegetables in today. And then before you know it, it's dinner time. I've just finished dinner. I have had yet another microwave meal. And I'm going, oh, 
oh, I never got the vegetables in today. Okay, I'm going to start tomorrow. And then it's like a willpower thing. Oh, well, I don't really feel like doing it now. So, so I'll do it later today, but I just don't feel like doing it now. And then, of course, later today, not feeling like doing it. I was doing this all over the place. I would say that before I got a clear picture of how to use habit formation to create healthy habits, I was someone who stayed up as late as I wanted, even though I swore to myself I would go to bed earlier. Then, of course, the next day would sleep in. Then, of course, the next day, my day is not starting the way I want it to. Then the next day, also, whenever I was tired, I would notice that I would want to reach for sugar more. And by the way, today's podcast is not at all going to be about like, here's the diet I think you're supposed to follow or the exercise regimen I think you're supposed to follow or diet culture or any of that. But there's a pretty conventional agreement among doctors and a bunch of clinical research studies and things like that, that having a lot of sugar isn't great for you and that all of us, for the most part, have too much sugar. So I would reach for sugar and then I would experience mood shifts. I wasn't as effective in my life. I was tired a lot. I was agitated a lot. There was more stress. And I knew all the research. I'm sure you do too. I will just quickly sum it up as just saying that when you pull together your sleep, your eating, and your exercise habits into whatever works best for you and for your body, when you get those things to be consistent, you will have a healthier immune system. Um, A lot of different hormones in the body, including hormones that are what are referred to as the feel-good hormones like serotonin or norepinephrine, all of those function better and it really becomes an upward spiral. When you aren't attending to your physical health, there's a downward spiral. The lack of sleep starts to become, I don't feel like exercising and because I don't feel like exercising, then I don't really feel like eating anything that would nourish me. I just want to reach for the sugar. And then because I reach for the sugar, now I'm really tired. And then I'm my erratic sleeping. And then it's, it's a downward spiral. But when you can create healthy habits in the areas of sleep, eating and movement or exercise, there is an upward spiral. As you start to exercise, you start to feel better and then you start to sleep better. And then you start to go out, you know, what do I actually feel like eating here? What would feel good to eat? Those are the questions that start to enter your mind. Again, I want to say there was a time when listening to just the first few minutes of this podcast episode, I would have said, okay, you're an alien. I don't know what you're talking about. I've heard this my whole life. And you people who talk about this stuff, I don't know what you're talking about. Because to me, trying to stick to a bedtime schedule is just hard. And that's all it is. Trying to eat things that are healthier and not eat the things that aren't as healthy is just hard. And that's all it is. Trying to convince myself to exercise is just hard, and that's all it is. That's what I would have said. Totally, I'm not that person anymore. So let's just start out this podcast episode. If you are someone who's nodding your head going, yeah, Kate, totally, that's where I'm at. Are you willing to shift? Are you willing to entertain the possibility that you could shift? Are you willing to try on shifting? Are you willing to change? And I have another podcast episode that I produced a while ago that was really asking the question, are you wanting to change or are you wanting support for where you're at? This is important for noticing things like if you are swearing on a stack of Bibles to everybody you know, I, oh my gosh, I just really want to shift some things with my physical health. I've got to start creating more healthy habits. And, and da, da, da. Are you saying that? from a place of truly wanting to change? Or are you saying that from a place of really feeling like that's not what I want right now, it's aspirational, and to be honest, what I really want right now is support for where I'm at. There is absolutely nothing wrong with wanting support for where you're at, but get the aha now about the difference between the two because you are not going to change if you are not actually saying to yourself, no, really, I want to do this different. No, really, I'm tired of saying I'm going to do it differently and then I don't. No, really, I'm actually really over this. And no, really, I deserve a better life. I deserve a life where I have energy, I sleep well, and I just all around feel better. That is the mindset that you've got to step into. And I'm also really aware that when it comes to a discussion of physical health, It is in part an issue of 
privilege, and access to resources. So for sure, if you are listening to this podcast and you're struggling to get food at all, some of what I'm about to say might not apply to the situation you are in. If you are a shift worker and that is the only work that you can get, it, and, and you're going, lady, you're going to help me with my sleep? Yeah, of course. I'm not speaking to somebody who is in a circumstance where erratic sleep is just the name of the game for the situation that they're in. So privilege is always behind a topic or integrated, I guess you could say, with embedded in a topic. I can't think of a single topic in which privilege couldn't play some kind of role where somebody would have more of an advantage of some kind than someone else. What I will speak to in this is find a way to do what you can with what is available. That's all. That's all. I'm not trying to turn anyone into a gold medal Olympian here. I'm not a gold medal Olympian. But I will speak to how can we get this to be as simple as possible as possible to put healthy habits into our lives. So start with a commitment. You deserve to live a life that is not just meh. You deserve to live a life that is as excellent as you are able to make it be. And you will never find that if you do not do what you can do to be as physically healthy as you can. That's it. Physical health, all I'm talking about here are, are like things like health for longevity, health for sleeping better, health for regulating mood and diminishing anxiety. That's it. I'm not talking about what can you bench press. I'm not talking about how fast can you run. I'm not talking about ableism where it's like health is defined as you have to be able to do X, Y, Z moves. I'm talking about for you in your particular circumstances, will you first commit to wherever I can with whatever resources I have, I will try to create the healthiest possible life for myself. And again, in this podcast, focusing on physical health. So let's get going. First thing I'll say that helped me a lot with creating healthy habits was to simplify. The great information age has been such a benefit to us in so many ways. You can find out just about any little health factoid you want. You can go on to scholar.google.com. You can look up pretty much any study. You won't necessarily have access to the nitty gritty of all the studies because some of them are behind a paywall, but a lot of the abstracts are there and you can get a lot from an abstract. So you can know so many things now about health, physical health, right down to the cellular level. And all those articles, especially because research studies are constantly contradicting themselves, and then we don't have the time to look and see, well, who funded that research study that suddenly said that this or that was healthy for you? Oh, turns out somebody who manufactures that product says it's healthy for you. We don't have the time to to wade through all the noise. So my suggestion is simplify. Physical health, just looking at it as eating, sleeping, movement. Eating, sleeping, movement. And in case you're wondering, well, what else would like people include with that? I mean, you can really get in there. Like, here's what you need to be doing for flexibility. Here's what you need to be doing to prevent osteoarthritis. Here's what you need to be doing to make your skin glow. Here's what you, it's like, oh, it's too much. It's too much, (laughs) y'all. You can't be thinking about what your bones will be doing in 20 years and your flexibility and mobility and your skin. And it's just, it's too much. So eating, sleeping, movement. Let's just keep it at that. All right. So Now that we've simplified it down to eating, sleeping, movement, with everything that I'm going to say in this podcast episode, let's forget about, let's also keep it simple, let's forget about sweeping changes. Let's forget about the idea that next week you're going to sign up for, I don't know, like some boot camp and do a detox and then also like get 12 hours of sleep. Like it's a, no, y'all have lives. I have a life. I am. I run a company that has 15 different contractors spread out all over the United States and Canada. I write books. I appear on podcasts. I have a kid. I am married. I have laundry to do. I have actually not outsourced my, you know, grocery shopping and laundry and household tasks. Like I still do those things. So 
I'm busy too. I need to keep it simple as well. So that's what everything I'm going to talk about today is going to be. How do we just keep it simple? No sweeping changes. So we're going to start with eating. Personally, I think with eating, instead of thinking about the, or even labeling foods as bad, you know, air quotes bad, which is a hallmark of diet culture, instead of denying yourself or calorie counting or macro counting, which I don't even understand, or, and and y'all know if you've listened for a while, I am crazy about CrossFit. I love CrossFit. But I see these CrossFit athletes weighing their food and I'm like, it doesn't even make sense to me. Why would you weigh your food? I'm not, I mean, if it works for them, fine. It works for them. You know, you do what works for you, but I do not understand the concept of putting your food on a weigh scale to weigh it. That makes no sense to me. Like lettuce is healthier than cotton candy, but why would you weigh it? Like, or, or maybe they weigh about the same, but like, why would you weigh it? I don't get it. Lettuce is healthier. The, the, the weight doesn't matter. So instead of going that direction, instead of denying or counting or any of that, I say, add in nutrition. That's it. Add in nutrition and whatever you add in, make it a habit to add in nutrition. So this looks like, um, for me at least, I have a green smoothie most of my lunches. And I don't mean I have like this really nice, I go to the juice place and I get this like $15 green smoothie and it's like full of all this stuff. No, no, no. That's not what I do. Frozen vegetables. I get a pack of frozen kale. I get a pack of frozen spinach. They're like a dollar each at the grocery store. So now we got $2 and one pack each is going to get me probably, you know, three green smoothies. I get a pack of mango, pack of strawberries, and I add a banana. Water in the blender, put them all in there, blend it. It probably costs me, I don't know, per serving, $3. And that's what I have with lunch. I've made it a habit so that I can't forget it to, right after breakfast every day, take out a big mixing bowl And just take all of my frozen green smoothie ingredients and put them in the mixing bowl to thaw. Because personally, I don't like a really cold smoothie unless it's a very hot day. So that's what I do. It also, it keeps me, keeps me honest. So, you know, I know it right after breakfast. If I've run out of an ingredient, I know that right after breakfast. So I'm not going to do this thing where I go to open up the freezer at lunchtime and, oh, wait, I'm out of something. What am I going to do? And then make a choice to eat something that isn't going to make me feel as good. It's like, okay, here we go. I got, I got these things. So it's cheap and it's a habit that I can put into my life. You might choose to do something different. Maybe what you want to do to add in nutrition is going to be you have a salad every day with dinner. Maybe what you want to do to add in more nutrition is maybe you have scrambled eggs every morning for breakfast. Can you add in, again, go the frozen vegetable route. Can you saute some vegetables alongside your eggs? And then boom, they're done with breakfast time. I would say too, uh, you're looking for other cost-effective options. Uh, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, all those dollar stores, they sell canned goods. If you watch out for a sale from your local grocery store, you can get canned goods. There's this idea that I think people have adopted that the only way to eat nutritious food is if you have practically an in-house chef making you a microgreen salad with like a pistachio vinaigrette and some cranber- dried cranberries and um, shaved fennel. And like, I'm, I don't even know if any of that would taste good altogether, by the way. It sounds kind of fancy, but... You get what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be so complicated. And also, you don't have to eat vegetables at every single meal. My baseline is I'm going for that green smoothie at lunch every day. Then I know I got some kale and spinach, which are full of calcium and iron and all kinds of good stuff in once a day, not to mention the benefits of the fruit and the fiber from the fruit. And of course, there are people who'd be like, no, it's too much glucose and da, da, da. You do you. I'm not into looking at the glucose and profile of every food that I eat. That doesn't work for me. Um, if it if it works for you, works for you. Cool. But I'm just saying, can we get in some more vegetables? I don't care what diet you're on. Talk to any doctor. Any doctor is going to say yes. More vegetables are a good idea. 
thumbs up. That's all I'm talking about. So if your vegetables are, I have a canned, I have a can of green beans and I drain the can of green beans and I eat them alongside everything else that I'm having for dinner. Good on you. You got a vegetable in winning gold star. So I hope you get what I'm getting at here, which is let's stop the madness of trying to count things or deny ourselves things, which just never goes anywhere good. And instead go, how can I actually nourish myself? And since there's a general consensus that more vegetables, thumbs up, just get in a few more vegetables, start there. You might decide from there, you know what, actually, I don't want to do this or that food. Great. If you do that later, that, the, you know, you'll make that decision. For now, just start with the nutrition. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about sleep. Create healthy habits around sleep. This is probably one of the trickiest things that I have ever shifted for myself. And I got to tell you, this is related to the autoimmune diagnosis that I got a couple years later after the autoimmune diagnosis at age 36, I went into menopause. True story. And I started getting hot flashes in the middle of the night and they would wake me up and then it would be very hard for me to go back to sleep. So I had to really start paying attention to what is termed clinically sleep hygiene. I will list a couple of the things that you already know that you can create habits around. Number one, put your phone down, put it away. And if I sound a little bit like an annoyed mom right here, it's a little bit because I feel like people in general are acting a bit like children with the whole, but I can't put my phone down. I just thought you like, yes, you can. (laughs) That's all I want to say. Yes, you can. You actually can. It's this thing that you can actually do. You can put your phone down. (laughs) Go put it somewhere else. I don't know where it needs to go, but it should not be in your hands for several hours before bedtime. Oh, but what if somebody's trying to text me and it's an emergency? Well, you know, like up until phones became ubiquitous, what happened was People called phones and sometimes people didn't answer or they had to leave a message and you found out about it later. That's actually how it goes sometimes. So like just put your phone in another room, put your phone down. Devices, iPads, anything that gives off blue light. And this whole like, well, but I use the blue glasses and da 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 da. If you're having problems sleeping, stop, 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 stop with the blue glasses and da, da, da. There's something going on and it's time to put away the tablets and the devices. Television, I think can kind of work for people, but other than that, put it away, put the devices in other rooms, plug it in your charger, put it in a drawer. I don't know. Put it away. You know, you need to, let's just start that habit. How could you start it as a habit? Pick a time when you officially shut your phone off, turn it off completely if you need to, and put it into another place. Put a reminder on your phone, maybe even, that says, hey, put me away, okay? Lots of apps that you can set up on your phone to tell you to turn off your phone. All right, so devices, phones, tablets, all that stuff, put them away. All right, next thing. Uh, Sleep is best when it is habitually, you go to sleep at a certain time and you wake up at a certain time. Here's where I personally struggled. And it was like, Oh, when I finally figured this out, I would tell myself I wanted to go to bed earlier and then get up earlier. So I'd try to go to bed earlier, but because my body clock was accustomed to going to bed later, I wouldn't go to bed at the time that I wanted to. And then the next day I would find it really difficult to get up in the morning. And then the whole cycle would, would go over and over and over. And I would sleep in trying not to be tired all day or sleep past when I wanted to trying not to be tired all day. Well, I finally just figured this out. Here's how it goes. You want to set up a new go to bed, wake up earlier time, or just change your bedtime routine in general. It's going to be about two weeks. And for about two weeks, you're going to be tired. That's it. 
So all this like going to bed at a certain time and then, oh, but it, I didn't go to bed when I thought I'd want to. And then, so I try to sleep more the next day to compensate. And da, da. No, no, no. It's just, you just got to like get up and for two weeks it's hell. Now I find it a lot easier. I talk about this alarm clock. I talk about this. I've, I've mentioned this particular alarm clock so many freaking times I should get a commission for it, but I'm not an affiliate for it. The Philips sunrise alarm clock. Now, speaking of privilege, it's a very expensive alarm clock. It's one of the most ridiculous purchases I've ever made, but it works. It's like 140 bucks. It's on Amazon and it is basically a sunrise alarm clock that has a low light that then gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And it makes it so much easier to wake up than being in a dark room, dead sleep, and your alarm suddenly starts blaring. Oh, and speaking of alarms, the whole like my phone is my alarm and that's why I have to keep it in my room thing. No, you don't. Again, you can get a digital alarm clock and plug it in really, really easily. You could have your phone in another room and you could wear a Fitbit and it would vibrate on your wrist to wake you up. There are a lot of other options that keep your phone out of your room. So that's, that's my speech. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. So alarm clock, Philips sunrise alarm clock, super helpful. So if you are really like, I want to get up earlier to have time for myself or to have time to exercise or to have time to, um, write my novel or, 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 and you've really struggled with that. First thing is you got to have a consistent bedtime. So you got to go to bed at the same time each night. You got to wake up at the same time each day. So those need to be consistent and then do what you can do to get up earlier and just understand that, you know, whether you do it through an alarm clock or this sunrise alarm clock I'm talking about or whatever it's going to be, it's going to be two weeks where you're just like, oh my God, you know, when you first wake up, extra coffee, might need some extra coffee. Speaking of coffee, do you know whether or not you're sensitive to caffeine? Because if you are sensitive to caffeine, you really should not be having it for like 12 hours before you plan to go to bed. Personally, my caffeine consumption is cut off at like 9 a.m. Because if I try to, if I am, if I'm tired and I go for that like iced coffee in the afternoon, nine o'clock at night's going to arrive and I'm going to be like Kristen Wiig in Bridesmaids when she's all hopped up on the Valium or what it, muscle relaxers or whatever it was on the airplane. And she's like, I'm ready to party. That's my Kristen Wiig impression. Um, yeah. So things that are uppers and for some people who may not realize this, but you might be sensitive to sugar. That's another thing that can um, be problematic. Drinking wine can disrupt sleep. Uh, obviously doing physical activity really, really late at night, trying to, um, you know, figure out some kind of complex equation really late at night that can disrupt sleep. And the last thing I'll say about sleep is we are all different. I know that there are, it's, it's more, it's less common, but there are people who are termed night owls and their biological clocks. Actually, they feel more awake the later it is they feel more rested when they actually put their brains to work a little bit at night and then wind down for bed. So if that is you, of course, you're modifying and you're adapting everything I'm saying here for, hey, this is how I am. I'm a night owl rather than an early riser. Even if you're a night owl, your biological clock will work better when you go to sleep and wake up at roughly the same times. Your biological clock will work better if you don't take a stimulant a couple hours before bed. You are going to have better melatonin production if you are not on devices that disrupt melatonin production before you're trying to go to bed. So again, you're adapting all of this to whatever works best for you. All right, now I'm going to talk about movement. How can you create healthy habits around movement? Well, here's what I've found to be helpful. Um, there are really two things, actually. One is to be active in small spurts. The pandemic forcing all of us to do shelter in place has also given rise to a lot of people doing a lot more walking than they were previously doing. I think there is this stereotype in our culture that people who are really, air quotes, healthy and active are people who are like running marathons, doing triathlons, lifting a bunch of weights. They've got some kind of, you know, I, I don't know, like baseball team they're on or softball team they're on or something. It's like, 
No, not necessarily. I'm, I would absolutely say, and there is clinical research supporting this, taking multiple walks during the day is really great for your health. Even if you aren't like sweating and wearing a muscle tank, you can take walks during the day. So small spurts are great. There is a book that I've recommended to people before. It's called The First 20 Minutes. And if you look up this book and if you read it, uh, it has a, a lot of really fun physiological exercise nerd information that I geek out on. I love it. If you just want the gist of the book, it's this. It's something like 80 or 90% of all benefits from exercise come in the first 20 minutes of exercise. And the the 20% thereafter that, that's on the table, that's all you're getting for the longer sweat session. So if somebody goes for a run for 60 minutes, they actually get 80% of the benefits that you get from running in the t- first 20 minutes of that hour-long run. They only get 20% more of the benefits from the remaining 40. So in other words, you don't need to be an overachiever. This is one of the reasons why I love CrossFit. Now, I'll touch on that real quick. Longtime listeners know that I really, 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 really love CrossFit. I used to be a triathlete. That was like having a part-time job. That was not small spurts. That was like training to be good at running and then going, oh, but I also need to train to be good at swimming. Oh, but I also need to train to be good at cycling. Oh, but now I feel like I haven't devoted enough time to run. It, It was just constant. And the running, swimming, and cycling sessions were quite lengthy. CrossFit, the average workout is about 20 minutes. There is a book called Learning to Breathe Fire. Great book. It's all about CrossFit, and it even gets into some of the science of CrossFit. And when I say great book, and you're thinking, who wants to read a book about the science of CrossFit? The way the book is laid out is very Malcolm Gladwell-like in the sense that a story is being told and then the science is kind of woven in. So like Malcolm Gladwell, he does this with all of his books where he he kind of tells the story of someone's life and then the science is woven in. Charles Duhigg, when he wrote The Power of Habit, very similar. There are these anecdotes about uh, these narratives of, of what people are going through as they discover shifts and changes in how they made a a change with a habit. And then he weaves in the science. Here's the study that shows why that person was successful at this. Here's the study that shows why this person was not. So uh, the first 20 minutes and learning to breathe fire, both great books if you want to learn about the benefits of short form exercise. Another reason I love CrossFit is that I know you've probably seen some really like muscled up CrossFit Games athletes, but the average CrossFit athlete is just doing basic stuff. And especially since the pandemic, air squats, lunges, sit-ups, push-ups, maybe if you can find a pull-up bar, some pull-ups, a lot of people are doing body weight only workouts and they're highly effective. They're only 20 minutes, most of them anyway, and to me, that's that's just kind of amazing. Like I'm a busy person to get amazing results where I have more energy, I feel more alert, I can concentrate better, I'm sleeping better from, in essence, a 15 to 20 minute workout is pretty freaking great. So that's why I like it so much. Now, I've just extolled the benefits of what I like, but if you like to do Zumba in the park, do Zumba in the park, you know? Like there's this... I, the, the, the sort of arguing that happens about like which mode of fitness is supposed to be the best one or the most beneficial, the most beneficial fitness or, or exercise or whatever you want to call it is what you will stick to and do consistently. If you love to take a walk and you combine that with bird watching or stopping halfway through your walk to sit down and sketch And you're like, but that's not exercise. Yeah, it is. You're just moving your body. It's just movement. It lubricates the joints. It keeps your bones strong. It makes your heart healthy. That's all we're talking about here. If you are somebody who is differently abled or you have some kind of physical limitation, sitting in a chair and raising your arms over your head multiple times, doing lateral arm raises, even if you do not have a dumbbell in your hand, very helpful for you. You just do what you can. You do what makes you feel good. Stretching. Do something that gets you moving. 
Do something that gets you moving and do it in small spurts. It doesn't have to be a marathon unless, of course, that's what you love to do and it gives you a sense of pride, accomplishment, etc. The other thing that I found really helpful with creating a healthy habit around movement is to always be active at the same time each day. In essence, treating it like an appointment. When you treat it like an appointment, it ends up getting done. You put other appointments around whatever you're doing for movement rather than trying to fit in movement among the other little snippets of your day. Unless I'm sick, every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 4 o'clock, you will find me doing a CrossFit workout. There are times where I feel more sore or something like that, and I might modify the CrossFit workout, but I don't feel like it for me, is not a reason to not do the workout or do a workout or do some kind of movement, period, end of story. It's just a decision I've made that that as soon as I start allowing a part of myself to go, well, maybe not today, maybe it's not the best day, I don't know, do I really? It's too much decision fatigue. And now that brings me to the real gist of why I'm talking so much about simplifying things I think the reason most people don't stick to the healthy habits that they create is because they, and it's an accident, it's unintentional, they set themselves up in such a way that they're going to have to make a lot of decisions. And I've alluded to that in several of the examples I've given for sleeping, eating, and now movement or exercise. They set themselves up for failure and it's inadvertent, but that's what happens because it's like, well, what time am I going to go to bed tonight? I don't know. Maybe I could stay up a little later tonight and then just sleep in tomorrow. Oh, I'll go to bed earlier tonight and then I'll get up earlier tomorrow. And it's like always, no, this is what time I go to bed and this is what time I wake up. Same thing around eating. You know, it's just like, well, you know, what am I going to eat today? And da, da, da. Well, I don't know what I'm going to eat every single day, but I do know I've got that green smoothie happening at lunchtime. Movement. I don't know what type of workout I'm going to do that day but I do know it's going to be Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday at four o'clock. So the first way that you're trying to simplify everything is instead of trying to somehow figure out every aspect of your life, you're just going, all right, eat, sleep, move. Physical health, eat, sleep, move. And from there, you're going, okay, when it comes to eating, instead of counting, making it complicated, got to remember I can't have this, I could have this, I got to measure this. It's just how do I get more nutrition into my life and be consistent at that. Sleep, it's how can I set myself up for sleep and be consistent about that. Movement, how can I be active in small spurts and again, be consistent, set myself up for that consistency. If you set up just a few small boundaries for yourself, this is what I do, this is when I sleep, this is how I eat, this is when I exercise, just a few small boundaries around those things in whatever way works for you, you will find that it becomes easier to be consistent about those things. As it becomes easier to be consistent about those things, it's easier, of course, to continue to be consistent about those things. Yay, you've officially reached the land of it is a habit. It's not even something you need to think about anymore. There's no decision fatigue with trying to decide, well, when am I going to da 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 da? It's just what you do. It's just the way life works. Now, I'm going to say just one more thing that I'm hoping will be helpful as we conclude this episode, and it is this don't expect it to be easier for at least four to six weeks. And when you say the numbers four to six weeks, it sounds like, oh, four to six weeks, that's not that long, you know? When you're actually doing it, it seems kind of like, whoa. So don't expect it to be easy for at least four to six weeks. Thus, if your inner critic gets really loud about why isn't this easier and why aren't you doing it better and da, 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 it's like, well, because I haven't been doing it for at least four to six weeks and I think that having some kind of a habit tracker is hugely beneficial. And personally, I really love um, good old fashioned pencil and paper, a grid. Here are the habits. And then I get a check next to them for each day I do it. If you want to go digital, I love the productive app. 
super simple app you can download, not too expensive. And it's very simple to set up and you just set up like, yeah, uh, just, it's like a checkoff. I did it or I didn't. That's it. As things are hard, when you're setting up these habits, if they're hard, they might not be, but as things are hard, as they are likely to be, as you're first setting up these habits, remember, you're not doing it because you're trying to fit some kind of diet culture, end up on the cover of a magazine or any of that. You're doing this because you genuinely want to prime your body and your brain for less stress, for feeling happier, like feelings of happiness just coming over you randomly throughout the day. This is what's possible when some of these habits get into place. Feeling more patient, better focus, better able to concentrate, less likely to get a little cold because your immune system is better. Feeling more of a sense of possibility, feeling stronger, feeling more grounded. This is why you're doing this. You're doing this because you deserve to live an excellent life. And that's what I'm hoping you will make a decision to step into right here, right now. All right, that's today's podcast. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. You know you can continue the work and the fun if you want to. Head on over to yourcourageouslife.com forward slash begin and become a Your Courageous Life subscriber because as soon as you sign up, you get access to an entire library of worksheets and audios and other bonuses. And of course, you'll be receiving more courage in your inbox and who wouldn't love that? You can learn more about the Courageous Living Coach Certification at teamclcc.com. You can get The Courage Habit at your local bookseller on Amazon, wherever you like. We can even connect on social media. I'm on Facebook at Your Courageous Life. So look for facebook.com forward slash Your Courageous Life. And I'm on Instagram as Kate Courageous. And I'd love to connect with you on Instagram. So here's to you using these courageous tools in your life and creating a real ripple effect of good. And again, thanks so much for listening. I love it that you're here.